Um, so I probably was either going into the hospital or out of the hospital uh, in 1949, because it looks like I'm about three years old. Um, I was born in 1946 on September 11th, 1946. In the late 40s and 50s, everything seemed okay. Uh, the, the world was kind of at rest because of the end of the, the terrible war. And I think at this time, like I'm saying, I'm on the way either into the hospital or out of the hospital, I came down with polio. Myself and my brother both uh, came down with it. And uh, I don't know how my mother went through that. Um, but it's been with me my whole life. So I think it's an important thing to talk about, the hospital. Um, but both of us emerged pretty well. I mean, I do have paralysis in my left shoulder. Uh, my brother uh, pretty much had no repercussions from it. Um, but I remember um, the first time somebody lied to me, and that was when I was in the hospital. Um, <clears throat> and I was crying for my mother, um, because I guess at that age, that's what you, you're doing. And I was causing a, a ruckus on the floor, because I think we were in wards. We were put on a boat in the harbor in Boston. That's where they isolated the polio uh, victims because they didn't know how it was spreading. They, they had very little knowledge in the late 40s about that. So um, I remember crying out for my mother, creating a ruckus, and this nurse coming over and saying, well, if you'll be quiet, I'm going to go and call your mother, and I'm going to get her over here. She'll come over and, and, and see you. So I sat there waiting, and I went over with the nurse to, I, can, I could actually draw a picture right now of what that phone booth looked like, how high it was. I can remember the nurse picking up the receiver. It was a, a booth, a phone booth. And her talking to my mother, saying that, uh, you know, come on, oh, please come over because Sandy is crying for you. And then I waited and I waited and I waited, hour after hour after hour, and she never came. So my conclusion from that was not that my mother was actually called or that my mother didn't care about me, my conclusion was that the nurse had lied to me. I moved to different suburbs. This right here is um, in the 40s in Massachusetts. OK, this is, this is my house in California, which we moved to when I was in high school, early high school, junior high school, so 12 years old, 13 years old. And I remember the enormous cultural shock of um, going to, com to a completely different part of the United States, which I can imagine almost everyone in this audience can relate to in terms of coming from a completely different country to the United States. So in any event, this traveling around, I think, did um, inform me in terms of how I thought about the United States. That in some ways, I don't really have a hometown, for example. Um, this is the college that I went to. I chose at the time to go to an all-women's school, Smith College. Um, and so you can see that uh, basically we were, um, I, I loved it. It's still a women's college today. And it was um, rigorous. What I wanted at the time was to focus entirely on intellectual stuff. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between feeling and the mind in general. Um, and in some ways, I feel oppressed by my mind. I feel oppressed by rational thinking. And um, that part of what I need to do is to um, diminish that part of myself. 
I went after Smith College, I went to the University of Iowa for graduate school. And this right here is my graduation thesis, my MFA graduation thesis in 1972 in Iowa City. So you can see that at the time in 1972, um, I was graduating in painting when there's like no painting. So the thinking at the time in, in the art world, because of course we were fascinated with what was going on in the art world, what were the, what was the goal of, uh, what were the goals of successful contemporary artists? And at the time, it was really all about breaking boundaries, breaking the boundaries of different media. And so what you see is a kind of the beginning of an interest in installation. And there's no photography. There was a photography program there. But at the time, I had no interest in still photography at all. And I was mainly interested in, in painting. So on the floor in the foreground, you, that's popcorn, which I had to figure out how to paint it with spray lacquer paint. Um, everything I did myself. So a lot of it had to do with learning, which is another part of what I'm interested in. After my work at Iowa, I took all of my graduation stuff, packed it into a van, and moved it along with a friend of mine who was graduating as well to Worcester Street here in New York City in Manhattan. We rented a loft together. He was a friend, uh, not, a, not a boyfriend. And I was overwhelmed by the New York uh, zeitgeist at the time. Zeitgeist being what is the prevailing mood and feeling of that period of time. In 1972-73, the prevailing zeitgeist was conceptualism. And out of conceptualism, I got really interested in the idea of similarity and difference and mistakes. What makes something a mistake? And I started reading a lot of philosophy and had several exhibitions. Um, this right here is a close-up drawing of a work I did in which I tried to scribble inside these parallel lines. And then I made mistakes. So I then went back and did a drawing on top of that drawing where you see the red circles. That's a mistake. These are highway mistakes. So early photography, highway mistakes, where the people painting the, uh, the signs on the, on, the, uh, on the road made mistakes. Um, so photography, for me, came in through conceptualism, came in through um, uh, not so much trying to run out and take documentary pictures of the world as it was happening around me, but rather interest from these ideas of similarity and difference and mistakes. This is a show that I had actually at the University of Hartford, which is where I was teaching, 73, 74, 75. Um, and on the wall, you can see those mistake drawings from far away. And on the left is some Xerox conceptual work. Similarity and difference then started to take a closer, a bigger foreground uh, interest for me in terms of uh, how we live, how Americans live, what we think is beautiful, what, is a, what gives us pleasure. Uh, so I took a drive along Route 1 between Boston and Portland, Maine. And it actually goes really close to the water along that Route 1 were all these little cottages that were vacation homes. And I was amazed at the similarity and difference, which of course we see today everywhere, but between these cottages. So th these are straight photographs of vacation homes, some more luxurious than others. Um, but again, just this idea of how the background is so important to helping you or me understand the foreground. 
that if you go quick, you kind of think you're looking at the same thing, but you're actually looking at a different thing. So that kind of similarity and difference is, I think, really embedded in my consciousness. At the same time as that, I was doing that, I was also interested in being alone. I love being alone. It's really important to me to be alone. It's, um, in today's world, it's, I think, an, something at least I actively have to create for myself. Um, and it, it's such a luxury. I mean, the word luxury is probably the zeitgeist of our time. Um, and so I, rather than just doing photography, I also started to work in my studio on the idea of repetition. So these are dots made starting with the letter A. Can you see the letter A there in the, in the middle? So, so I would just do this very, very, very simple thing next to the letter A like that and just grow, whoop, grow, grow it out slowly. And this, this actually, this process became a very elaborate, very lengthy period for me, um, kind of characteristic in some ways of persistence because I, love persistence. I respect persistence in other people and I enjoy it. I enjoy prevailing and continuing. Um, I remember, for example, as a child picking up, my parents had a very small library and I remember picking up the biggest, thickest book I could find just so that it would never end. So, uh, so this idea of a lengthy process, creating a lengthy process for myself, um, is continued in this repetition idea of the dots, now lines. So this, for example, I still have this painting. It's five feet square, and it's one continuous line. So it was done over a period of I don't know how many weeks, but just like this on a table and drawing around and around and around with a specific recipe of not touching itself. Sim remember the mistake things. So I had like little things that I had to follow, rules I had to follow in order to do it. And then at the end, you have something that is like not at all intentional. So that was another important theory or um, focus of conceptualism was don't think about what it looks like until afterwards. Um, so forget that consciousness about placement and composition, which was a very important part of art for you know, decades. Um, rather, put your brain first and let the visuals just emerge as a result of the process. So this conceptual thrust went on from 76 to 77, and at the same time, humor was important to me. So while I was teaching at the University of Hartford, I did a performance in the gallery with 25 pounds of jelly beans and 25 pounds of um, uh, gumdrops, gumdrops. And the idea being, um, again, to break boundaries, who cares? Of course, it's a photograph right now. At the time, it was a performance, but, uh, but just to kind of present something completely out of the blue, not fulfilling any particular category. So starting with these 25 pounds of each of those candies, I then kicked them across the floor. That was the performance part of it. And then I swept the jelly beans and gumdrops across the floor. So the title of the performance was Percussion for Jelly Beans and Gumdrops with Solo Broom. Uh, drawing, uh, keeping a diary, keeping a, a sketchbook has been a, an important part of my, my joy in life, my, my real joy in life, because it's when your idea could happen. You don't necessarily have to do it. 
it's just pure idea and it's in a flash, it comes to you, and over in a flash. But as you do it repetitively every day at a certain point, for me, it's the beginning of the day. I'm always freshest at the like 6 a.m., 5 a.m., 4 a.m. By the end of the day, I could never do a sketch like this. So this is a, a sketch from my notebooks, and this is a photograph that is related to that idea. So the sketch in the notebook and the time element, I have no idea how, how close they're related. But you can see that I wrote knees in tub and elbow and knee, how closely re related they are. But now what happened is my husband and I, while I was teaching at Rutgers, because I moved from Hartford, Connecticut to New York and was hired at Rutgers, which is close to here, uh, in New Jersey. We moved upstate because my husband was working in a television station. He was making his way through um, the media. He thought he wanted to be in media at the time. He is no longer in media. But uh, he was working in, a, in WUTR television in Utica, New York, a small TV station. They were still shooting film. And they hired him because he could repair the broken machines that broke all the time when they were shooting the news. So there we were up in Utica, New York, and where are we going to live? So it just turned out that a mobile home on a farm is where we lived. So we are living in a mobile home, which never before had I ever lived in a mobile home or known anyone who lived in a mobile home. And at the time, New York was the shabbiest, dirtiest, crappiest place on earth. The, the city was out of control. And the apartment that we lived in, for example, had one working electrical outlet. So uh, many of my friends, their bathrooms were down the hall, not inside the apartment, because that was how the um, tenements were built for the immigrants in the previous century. So here we go into this mobile home, and I'm going, oh my god, what luxury, because there were two bathrooms, not just one, and everything was working. And then, as I was looking around the uh, mobile home, I was just so touched by the effort made to make the occupant feel like they were surrounded by luxury. Uh, not that a person would look at those marble, fake marble walls and really think they were marble. And here again, philosophically, it's kind of like, well, why is actual marble luxurious? I don't know. Is it because it's all those swirly lines? Um, so I get carried away, like I told you, with these thoughts of why, why, why. But in any event, I loved the mobile home. And it opened up for me the opportunity to get more involved with still photography. Why? <clears throat> because of the subject matter, not because of still photography itself. I could have cared less about still photography. But I'm looking at this mobile home, at the pink interiors, um, at the bathroom, the uh, marble walls. At the same time, I'm doing these drawings in my notebook. Um, using uh, different parts of my body and using food, started to work with food. And then after we lived in the mobile home, which we only did for about four, five, six months, I moved back to New York and he stayed up in Utica while he was uh, working on his career. When I moved back to New York, my eyes were totally taken aback by commercial processes in photography. So rather than the kind of 8 and a half, 8 by 10, 11 by 14 black and white, either documentary photos or um, misty uh, 19th century black and white photos, I thought 
Boy, advertising photography is very interesting because how did they get that picture? What's outside that picture that made that picture look like that? And it, as you start to get involved in that relationship between how you see what you see and how you want your picture to re reflect what you see, you, you kind of slowly realize, boy, this is much more complicated than I thought. Um, so I started to do sort of artificial parodies of food still life photography. And I started to make my own prints in the bathroom of my apartment. I collected at the 5 and 10 cent store um, called Woolworths on 14th Street in New York. I collected backgrounds, which were kitchen uh, coverings, and food, different food I buy at the local supermarket, and then arrange it so that it blended in in a sa similar way to the way things blended in with the, um, with the, uh, uh, the cabins, the motel cabins. But also, with still photography, with one single picture, you have the opportunity, like a painter has, of warping the space. And uh, so I loved also doing this straight photograph of just the dessert plate in front of the dinner plate. Luncheon meat on a counter, cubed carrots and kernels of corn. <coughs> this is a box on a surface. So lighting just became an obsession for me. More and more, how does something reveal itself in terms of light and lighting? So I moved from a small uh, studio, which I had an uh, uh, actual room that was like half the size of this room. That's where I did the food still life work. And I then decided I wanted to have uh, an apartment that I could actually just work in. So in the apartment, there was a sink and a way that I could make my own uh, prints. And I started to take the, some of the ideas that I had about um, space, warping the space, what do you see first? When you look at this, for example, it's a kind of a blizzard, it's a deliberate blizzard, but at the same time, everything is really there. So this idea of filling up the space, horror vacui, it's called in uh, the Roman language, I think it goes back a long way. Some civilizations are much more concerned with it than others. But horror vacui means fear of empty space. So the idea energy-wise, sci science-wise, is that nature abhors a vacuum. Um, and so whatever, any time there is any kind of openness or emptiness, something will fill that emptiness. That's the philosophical background. Um, but for me, I just loved the fun of it, the activity of finding all of these things, working with these things. Um, these are the drawings that I did in my uh, notebook at the same time. Uh, hangers. This piece, uh, now we're in the 80s. It's about 1979, not quite 1980. But finding objects, arranging objects, um, setting up a 4 by 5 camera, and then going down the street, it was great. So easy at that time because you could get film processed anywhere in New York for about two to four hours, within two to four hours, because the commercial photography world was so dependent on it, especially 4 by 5 ectochrome, which is what I was shooting. So um, then I decided that um, in drawing and in, in the whole process, I wanted to make things more. I wanted to sort of put my hands in front of the camera. And so now she knew what it meant to be alone in a crowd. That's, it. That's what I wrote there on that drawing. So she's there among a bunch of cats. So these are sketches for, uh, from this, that period, 1979. And 
I started to then sketch, uh, not really sketch, sculpt, uh, using plaster and chicken wire, um, cats. I, I saw a lot of stray cats, not a lot, but stray cats on the streets of New York. And I loved their ability to survive. Uh, I thought they were fascinating to look at. And I had had cats as a child. So I started to just sculpt one cat, and then I realized it wasn't enough. So I sculpted another one, another one, and another one. So the process actually took place over three or four months of going every day to the studio and sculpting these cats. When I was done, I decided that I couldn't just throw the cats out like I had thrown out the, the triangles. I had thrown out the, um, the spoons. So now what? Well, I felt as though I wanted to show these cats that I had made. And we came up with the word installation. Um, it wasn't very common at the time. But there were a number of sculptors doing multimedia installation work. Um, that were uh, not photographers, but truly sculptors. Um, myself, because of my interest in sculpture and photography, for me, the photograph became a very convenient way to stop my obsession. Because when you are involved in repetition the way I was, you know, the dots, the lines, what ended the line, the one continuous line, was the five foot square canvas. So the five foot square canvas becomes the edge of the photograph. Um, this is Revenge of the Goldfish. Um, and all of the fish uh, I made out of ceramic clay over a period of about six months um, by hand. And I, wanted, I really wanted it to look as though it had been photoshopped. Um, but it wasn't. What you see was actually there. And uh, I did show this as an installation um, at a gallery in New York uh, in 1981, uh, January of 1981. This is an installation view from the gallery, Castelli Gallery, on 77th Street and 5th Avenue. Um, again, resemblance and difference. Uh, this is now 1984, a still photograph, uh, not uh, reversed the same people, I mean, excuse me, different people, but they look similar. Um, germs are everywhere, 1984. Uh, chewed gum, the idea of reality being things that we can't see necessarily, but they're real. Um, this is something that photography has certainly brought to our attention. Uh, and uh, so I just like the idea of coming up with these little tiny sculptures, uh, which were uh, difficult to do. I mean, I had to come up with what kind of gum looks best, looks most like gum. When you start to photograph something, you kind of enter into it, I think, and you ask yourself, well, what is it? What, how can I take a picture that most resembles what I'm thinking about that thing? So uh, I went through a lot of different gum, experimenting with colors and types of gum. Uh, then later in the late 80s, I did an installation and photograph in the on the Lower East Side. The zeitgeist in the late 80s was um, very wacky, very bright colors, very non-conceptual. And uh, this is showing you the process of putting this car into a gallery. So it was an interesting process for me in that I uh, learned that you can't just buy a car that doesn't work. It's actually illegal because um, it's not registered. The state doesn't know about it. Um, and so I kind of had to work in the New York way of paying directly the people to do, uh, to basically paint that car and here are the photographs that I took in the studio, not the studio, excuse me, the gallery, um, complete with wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Following the idea of sculpture, bronze sculpture, um, I wanted to do a piece in 87 using 
wax as a way to make all of these leaves out of metal. That's me sculpting them. And here is a Polaroid process showing the different phases in sequence of how I worked at the time because I was shooting 8x10 film and I had, by now, I had a Polaroid back. So I'd take the Polaroids home and draw on them and then go back into the studio and decide where should I hang a leaf. And so this is an end Polaroid here. I start, would start with black and white Polaroid because I didn't care about the color. And then we'd end up with using color Polaroid. And then finally, this is the ectochrome uh, with people. Now, the people in my pictures I've always thought a lot about. And they depend on different phases of my life. Some are family, some are friends, some are even professional models. Um, these people ha actually happened to be, one was a student at Rutgers in 1987, and that's the woman in the middle, an older student. Um, in 89, it was the 150th anniversary of the invention of photography, and I was invited by the Pompidou Center, along with other photographers, to create work for the show. And they particularly wanted artists who were working with across boundaries, sculpture particularly, and installation. So I sculpted foxes. And here is one of the Polaroids from that process. And here's the final photograph in the studio. By this time now, my studio was on the Lower East Side, Eldridge Street. This is the installation as it was shown at the Pompidou Center itself. So it kind of was very atypical of what was in the show, because it was a photography show. So this is another installation view, more close up. After that, I got involved in um, Food as a sort of sinister, having sinister and disturbing uh, qualities while you're working with it, while you're working with it. Not so much what the viewer is getting, but while you're working with it. So uh, this is called Body Limits, made with raw bacon. Now uh, the raw bacon sticks naturally to the wall if it's not too warm. Raisins, it's called Atomic Love. The Cocktail Party, Cheese Doodles. The Wedding, on the floor is Orange Marmalade, on the walls, Strawberry Jam. And then on, on the walls and floor, Handmade Ceramic Roses. This is called Shimmering Madness. On the floor are jelly beans. And on the wall, butterflies. Raining popcorn. And here we're getting into the uh, late 90s by this time with drawings of weather. I was really interested in weather and depicting different seasons and how sort of artificial exteriors. So um, this piece is called Fresh Hybrid. One of the things that I've uh, been doing all along as I've been showing you this stuff is I've been learning. I've been learning how to do something like working with bronze, or I've been learning how to, in the case of Fresh Hybrid, how to do um, handmade felt, because that's handmade felt covering uh, the figures. So learning for me is very important in terms of invigorating myself. And these, ag again, are drawings. Um, and so the next season or feeling that I decided to work with was um, flakes, snowflakes and winter. and. For some reason, I just could not 
get the idea of an eye and snowflakes. I couldn't separate them. So I kept working on this. I mean, this is a drawing from 2012. And that drawing, I just finished the photograph in December of 2019. So for this particular piece, the process became very, very lengthy. Um, what makes a snowflake a snowflake? How is it possible? Can I make a snowflake that no one else has made? Um, how can I combine these eyes, photographs of eyes of animals, with these shapes? So at every stage of the game, I was learning more and more digital processes, like, for example, working in Illustrator to do the shapes for those cut-out aluminum shapes on the wall, um, working with some of the new printing processes that are available um, uh, with printing onto metal. And uh, here, again, back to how does the thing photograph? How does, it, how does the camera um, appreciate what you're putting in front of it? And <clears throat> the most difficult part of the whole process was the color blue, because it shouldn't be a cheery blue. It should be a grim, cold, crisp blue. And I could not buy or find anywhere, after months and months of buying and trying on Amazon and everything else, could never find actual um, paper that was the right color. So I ended up painting that black foil. I don't know if you have that around here, but it's black thin foil for, for photographers. And because it's already painted, it takes paint very well. So I ended up with a paint and cutting up the foil and crumpling it. And this is the wall in my studio installing. This is the painting process of the black foil. And um, all along with this, I decided to learn 3D sculpting from scratch, meaning not, um, uh, not scanning something and playing around with it, but actually starting with a ball um, in the program called ZBrush. And, um, and I, unfortunately for myself, <laughs> the problem is nobody teaches it. A lot of these 3D programs are not readily available um, to just, oh, I'll go take a class at the Y, <laughs> you know, in 3D. I mean, it, it just, uh, it's just a very rapidly evolving area. And unlike our fabulous Photoshop, which I love, which everyone knows, and so yes, you can learn it anywhere, unlike that, in 3D, there are hundreds of different programs. Maybe that's an exaggeration. But there are more programs than you can imagine. And different people are doing different programs. They work completely differently. There must be four or five or six different appendixes on your, uh, on your file. And if you don't send the right file, and you're having a $10,000 thing made, you know, you're, it, it's a really heady, very heady, very, um, it's very new. So everybody who's involved in it is interested in it. But there's not a lot of time in, uh, to, to, um, uh, uh, to how, how can I put it? It's sort of like buy and try. I had to do things, and they would fail or the file would be wrong or whatever, and I had to learn like that, rather than like going to school and learning in you know, a decent amount of time. But ultimately, um, this is a 3D sculpture that I did uh, from uh, the, the, the ZBrush program. And what motivated me was the um, embossing process. I love the embossing and engraving process, which you can do in, in ZBrush. And um, these are small 3D prints from uh, Europe. That's where I feel they do the best printing, the best 3D printing. Printing and milling are totally different. Printing is when you take the little pieces of plastic, and one by one, they get dripped around and dripped around, just like, in a way, a, a digital photo with pixels. That's printing. 
um, but it has enormous limitations on its own and financially just not well suited to large things. When you go to large things, you go more to milling, like this is about 48 inches high. Um, but milling is also limited because if you can imagine uh, Michelangelo or a sculptor with a chisel and you have a block of marble and you're a human with a chisel, you, have, you can attack that marble from any angle that you want because you have all that flexibility. But if you're a machine, you don't have that flexibility. So the carving process is limited at the most to five axes. And a machine goes around the thing ch -ch -ch -ch, like that at one axis, then another axis, then another axis. So you ultimately end up with a very convoluted conversation with the people that are doing the work um, because they almost have to be as much of a sculptor as you are uh, in order to tell you what's going to work and what's not. Um, so we have a wonderful uh, 3D sculpting place in New Jersey down in Mercerville called Digital Atelier, and they, they did that. Um, this is from Materialize um, in Belgium. I think it's in Belgium. And now once you have your hard model, you can then go back to analog. So I had the owls done in bronze. This is a bronze owl. Um, this is a shot from my studio in uh, December of last year, 2018. And this is the shot that I took in December of 2018 called Winter. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, you have a question? I know that a lot of your work is in major museums. Mm -hmm. So would you talk about how you sold the installation pieces to museums and how they're keeping them and how they show them? Well, um, it's, uh, I think every person who uh, does anything, you know, I think more and the more uh, responsibility, responsibility that you take the better in terms of uh, your work being able to actually get out into the world. So that being said, <coughs> um, it, for me, it varies tremendously from one installation to another, depending on what age I was when I did the work, uh, how much uh, money I had to be able to store the work, because you can see that it takes up a lot of space, or can take up a lot of space. And I threw out a lot of work, which many sculptors do, just because of the storage uh, cost. Um, but I've been fortunate that some museums, the Denver Art Museum bought the installation of Fox Games. Um, so that was um, in 19, around 1990, it was shown in France in 1989, 1990. They showed it and then they subsequently um, purchased it. Um, Smith College Museum of Art uh, owns uh, Radioactive Cats and Revenge of the Goldfish. So I guess to more directly answer you, in my case, it usually comes after an exhibition there where they've seen, they've seen the work um, and they uh, also understand whether they can uh, hold on to it, you know, whether they can curate it, uh, whether they can show it themselves, um, because ultimately that's really what you want. You, you don't want them to have to call you up if, you, if they are going to show your work. So, um, so for me, it's happened after having had a show somewhere. And then later, though, in the, in the 90s, um, I've been able to, um, just because people knew my work, or uh, yeah, they knew the work, so um, they were interested in buying it. So the cocktail party, for example, which you would think, the cocktail party is made of cheese doodles, you would think that that would be very fugitive, but 
I made it more or less permanent by painting it over with epoxy resin, which soaked into all of the holes and glued co everything conglomerated it together. So it's, it's still around. It still exists. And, um, and so I have maps and books, like this piece here, Winter. Um, the uh, gallery that is uh, showing the photograph and the installation. Um, I couldn't show you the installation pictures, but basically I, I gave them a notebook of how to put it up in the same way that I put it up, which you saw me on the ladder putting it up piece by piece. Um, so, so the uh, getting out into the world, I think, comes in the early days for me, came after exhibiting. And it came very slowly. I mean, for me, it probably took about 20 years before people were really acquiring these things. Um, I mean, it's not as if I just had a show of radioactive cats in 1980 and then a museum bought it in a couple of years later. I mean, I think the museum that bought it was 10 or 15 years later. So, uh, but on the other hand, uh, I mean, it's great. Uh, I, I want to talk about the positive things about museums is that, yes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a, uh, an emblem of, um, of, uh, of achievement. But at the same time, it's, it's wonderful that they care so much because they really do, at least my, that's been my experience. So for example, with the cocktail party, um, it's in the collection of the McNay Museum, which is down in San Antonio, Texas. So they went to uh, take it out of storage after they had uh, acquired it, and it um, had been eaten. Not the whole thing, but some it, some of the elements they had taken it out of their out of its crates for for their storage problem, and some there a few pieces a few parts had been eaten by they didn't realize that they had little varmints in there, so they painstakingly restored it. So it it's it is a, a lovely thing to see happen. Because, um, of course, we would care that much, too, about our own work. But there does come, a severance, for me, a severance point, a point where I'm done. I'm done. I want to move on. I want to live in the present. I don't want to be constantly thinking about something you know, that I did 10 years ago. Um, so that's, you know, that's been my experience. I hope that answers your question. Maybe someone else has a question. I don't want to take up all your time. OK. And then the addition that you would make mm -hmm. from the photo mm -hmm. would be, can you say, like how many? Oh, it just depends on, on the image. Okay. So it depends. Thir I make large additions because it, like this last piece, took me 10 years. Oh, really? So yeah. OK. Yeah. <laughs>
limited to photography. I think I, I, I emotionally would, would feel terrible. I mean, can you imagine working on those sculptures and then throwing them away, never exhibiting them? Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to you all. Good luck, good luck, good luck. Keep going. That's the most important thing. If there's anything, if there's any question about that, I mean, uh, you know, I'm in touch now with students of mine from when I was working on radioactive cats, right? From from 1980. And and it is such a moving and wonderful thing to see how not everybody becomes an uh, artist, a full-fledged artist exhibiting and, and all of that. Um, but at the same time, you know, they keep the spark alive. They, they're very involved with art. So I just want to say, you know, don't give up. Keep going. And just, you know, make yourself happy. It's really about happiness. Thank you very much.